Today I'm going to show you what's inside of a dual clutch automatic transmission and how it works. Now this is a direct shift gearbox or DSG from a Volkswagen TDI. Taking a quick look around the transmission, here you can see we've got a dual mass flywheel. Here we've got the oil cooler and underneath this oil pan here is a mechatronic unit. Now coming around the back here, here you can see our axle flanges which will bolt up to the two axles going out to the front wheels in this car and we've got our gear selector. And looking from the back here, we've got our oil filter, engine mount over here as well as the oil pump under this cover here. Now the first thing I'll remove is this dual mass flywheel. Now a dual mass flywheel works by having two masses, one on the transmission side and one on the engine side over here to dampen torsional vibrations. You can see here we've got these two separate masses here. They're supposed to be dampened by springs but seems like this one's a little defective because I can do it by hand. Now a dual clutch transmission works similar to an automated manual transmission. As you saw there is just a regular flywheel that's going to spin the input shaft here for this transmission. There is no torque converter. The next major component here is the actual clutches themselves. So the mechatronic unit has its own computer power which is ultimately going to control the transmission. I'm going to go ahead and remove this unit here. And there's your transmission pen. Next up I'll remove the mechatronic unit. And then I can remove the mechatronic unit from the transmission. Alright so that wire actually attaches to the speed sensor on the input shaft. And here's that front cover that I can remove. This teardown is already starting to get messy, so I've got a piece of my wife's old thermal underwear here. It's not winter yet. Now removing that front cover reveals our dual clutches. So there is a circlip here that I need to first remove. Now I can remove this part here. This is actually the oil pump shaft. That's the first part. And then we've got a circlip to remove here. Now in order to take off that snap ring, I'm going to use my special snap ring removal tool. Alright, now I can remove that snap ring. Now I'm going to remove the dual clutches from the transmission. Now you see these two shafts here, there's one that runs on the inside and one that runs on the outside. There's a set of clutches here that work on the inside shaft and a set of clutches that work on the outside shaft. Taking a look at how this dual clutch setup works here, you can see if I take this apart here, we've got two splines. The larger one here is going to spline to the outside part of that shaft we saw in the transmission and the smaller one's going to spline to the smaller shaft. Taking a look inside of here, we've got two wet clutches, one on the outside over here and one on the inside over here and they're well encased in fluid for both cooling and longevity. Take Take a look at how this dual clutch setup works here. We've got the input shaft here which is splined to the flywheel and that's always turning with the engine which means that both this outside part which it's splined to and the inside part here is entirely rotating with the engine once it's spinning. Now in order to transfer torque from the outside part over here to the inside part which sits inside of here and thus the two input shafts on the transmission, we need to lock up these clutches over here. Now in order to lock up those clutches we need to apply hydraulic pressure to these two ports over here here which is going to send fluid inside these clutches here as you can see it's rotating because there's no pressure right now once it locks up it's going to transfer torque from the outside spline to the inside spline which is therefore going to transfer the torque to this spline over here and then into the transmission now the reason why you've got two concentric clutches is because one is for the odd gears and one is for the even gears. Furthermore, this setup is also going to be much faster than a manually engaging clutch like in a manual transmission. Now compared to the torque converter on an automatic transmission, there's a lot less power loss because a torque converter has to slip before it actually engages together to get you through the gears. We'll just take the snap ring off here so we can take a look at those clutches. Taking a look at the clutch material here, you can see that they're actually not worn out and they're in pretty good condition. This car had almost 300,000 kilometers. You can see that this alternates between the friction disc, which is splined to the inside, and thus the input side of the transmission, and the outside part here, which is just a metal disc that's splined to the input shaft of the transmission, and they just take turns alternating between each other. When you apply hydraulic pressure, just like in an automatic transmission, these are going to squeeze together and lock, and then your output and input are going to be matched, and it will transfer torque. And here's a look at the clutch bands for the outer clutch. Again, these are also in pretty good shape. And they also alternate between friction material and the plate. Alright, before we bust the transmission case open, there's a couple of accessories I want to remove. First being this oil pump, which is located on the opposite side of the transmission. And now I'm going to remove this oil pump assembly. Here's the oil pump. Remember that really long shaft that ran to the other side? Well, that's how the oil pump gets powered from the input shaft. Let's see if we can see what's inside of this oil pump here. Pop that open. So essentially fluid flows in from here and out from here back into the transmission. And then this gear in the middle here is going to rotate and that's going to squeeze the fluid in between here and that's going to create fluid flow. Alright, next up at the top here I'm going to remove the transmission mount. 
This is a cartridge style oil filter. Let's take a look inside of this filter here. They probably didn't do their oil change service on the transmission. All right, next up at the top here, we have the oil cooler. It's basically a giant heat exchanger where you got coolant cycling around in here. And then at the bottom here, you got oil cycling around in here. Next up, it's time to split the transmission casing. There are bolts that go all the way around this casing here to separate them into half. So apparently I can't split the transmission in half without removing the axle flanges. But for that, there's a special hex inside of here that you have to get to go in there and remove it. So I'll be back another day when I get the tool. Alright, so I had to buy an entire socket set to get this 6mm long hex here. And then on the opposite side here, I've got two bolts threaded into the flange so this doesn't rotate. And then I can go ahead and zip that free. And there's the flange. <sighs> Up off that flange. So before splitting the case, it looks like I got another circle up here to deal with. All right, let's see if we can lift this case off now. Now taking a look inside of this dual clutch automatic transmission, you can see that things are actually pretty simple and very similar to a manual transmission. Over here you have the input shaft and then these two are your output shafts. This white plastic thing, which I kind of broke here, actually takes oil pressure from the oil filter and forms part of a lubrication system. You can see it takes oil and sends it to critical areas in between these gears here to make sure they're well lubricated and cooled when you're on the Autobahn. Also over here we've got our selector forks and the final drive which forms the differential. Alright, so you better pay attention because this part's important. Now if you remember down below on the bell housing we had two input shafts. The inside one which is driving the odd gears and the outside one here which is going to drive the even gears. Now just like in a manual transmission all of these gears here are going to physically be turning and engaged when the vehicle is moving but that doesn't mean they're actually transmitting torque and that's because they're just rolling on their own shaft here. So let's take a look at how the individual gears work. Here we've got the input shaft for the odd section so let's say we wanted to go into first gear well that means the smallest gear has to drive the largest gear which is this one here so we need to engage this gear over here using the selector fork. So the selector fork is going to be pushed up and that's going to allow the input shaft to transmit torque to this gear and therefore to the output shaft down to the final drive. Now second gear is going to work over on this shaft here where you've got the next smallest gear which is this one over here that's going to drive the next largest gear. It's kind of hidden behind this fork but it's down over here. So in order to engage that you pop this guy down this way. That allows torque to transfer from the input shaft over here down over to the output shaft and then down to the final drive with the differential. The guy's got to start up his leaf blower exactly when I have to film. Now we're going to take a look at third gear so once again we're on the odd input shaft which is going to bring torque over here and then across to this one which is the next smallest one in line here you can see the gears are getting a lot larger from second to third which is going to create more speed on the final drive this fork is going to push down and that's going to engage it to this shaft over here which is going to send power out to the final drive likewise fourth gear is this one here which is the next largest one compared to third gear it's operating on the even shaft over here and that's going to bring power over to this gear here in order to select it, we need to put the shift to fork up and that's again going to transfer torque from it down to the output shaft and final drive. Now you can see on the back of the transmission we have another output shaft here for fifth gear, sixth gear as well as reverse gear and this also spline to the output shaft in order to give you the direct output. Alright, now we're going to be taking a look at fifth gear which is going to be on the odd shaft over here. You can see power is going to be sent through the input shaft over to this gear here which is only slightly larger than the output gear here. Now we're slightly getting to an overdrive situation we are going to take this shifter fork over here and push it up and that's going to engage fifth gear which is then going to transfer the torque down this output shaft here and over to the final drive. Taking a look at sixth gear over here you can see this is the one that was shared on the other side with fourth gear. This one spins a much smaller gear so that you get a nice tall gear ratio to save you fuel on the highway. You can see we've got this shifter fork here that's going to move up just like that and that's going to transfer the torque to the actual shaft and then down it to final drive. Now finally we come to the reverse gear and it actually shares the first gear over here on the odd input shaft. It's going to come over to this reverse counter shaft here which is going to reverse the direction of the gears. You can also see there is a gear reduction over here where a larger gear is going to spin a smaller gear and vice versa. At the bottom here it shares the synchronizer with six gear. So as I can select that down at the bottom there it's then going to transfer that reverse torque out to that shaft and then to the final drive in reverse. That gear reduction makes you move nice and slowly in the parking lot. It's interesting 
just gonna know that six and reverse share a synchronizer, but fifth has its own. So some other things to point out is you've got these rings here, which are going to be picked up by your input shaft speed sensors, as well as you got magnets over here and all these forks to collect debris, as well as these little balls over here to guide you inside of the transmission casing to make sure these forks aren't too sloppy. Now one of the bigger differences between this and a manual transmission is how these selector forks move up and down. In a manual transmission, you've got a manual selector, which is going to move them up and down based on the position of the shifter knob. In this case, it's controlled through hydraulics. You've got these little holes over here that are going to lead to this plunger. This is actually a cylinder. It's going to fill with hydraulic fluid, and that's what's going to engage or disengage the gears when you pressurize it or depressurize it. So it looks like I might have to get my snap ring removal tool in order to get the rest of this transmission off of the casing. We need to get these forks out of the way. Here's the other fork. The snap ring is the only thing holding this thing together. All right, let's see how much I can get off. Here's the input shaft here. Here's the final drive differential. Here's the other output shaft. Here's the reverse shaft. All right, taking a look at the transmission casing here, you can see this is where the final drive lives. And this is the parking pole mechanism. You can see when you engage park, this little tooth here is actually going to engage on the final drive to lock you in and prevent your vehicle from rolling away. Now this here is your fluid leveler. It's basically a long straw that sets the level of the transmission fluid that you need. You notice there's no fill port on this transmission. You actually have to pump it in from the bottom until it reaches this level. The rest is going to drain out. Finally, take a look at the pistons inside of here. You can see the pistons themselves actually are two piece. There's one on this half of the transmission and one on the other half of the transmission. That's why your selector fork looks like this. And as this piston pushes up, the other piston is going to lean back and that's what's going to allow precise control of where this shifter fork is. So here's the other half of the transmission. You can see the valve body or mechatronic unit would bolt up to here to control all the hydraulics. That's going to control these pistons, kind of made of a rubbery sealing material. And that's what's going to ultimately control the fork by moving it back and forth. Inside of here, furthermore, you can see you've got another oil pipe that's going to help lubricate things on this half of the transmission. Now remember over here, we've also got the oil filter as well as the oil cooler located on this half. And this is an oil filter of some sort. So here's a look at the final drive. You can see we've got our spider gears inside of there. And I do have another video on how differentials work. This Volkswagen is a little different because it actually has this little bolt here that bolts up to this spline, which is part of your spider gears inside of there. All right, taking a look at the output shaft number one and output shaft number two, you can see these here have different gear ratios as they go out to the final drive differential. This here is the reverse shaft, pretty simple and straightforward, so we don't need to talk about that. And this here is that unique input shaft where we've got one shaft on the inside and one shaft on the outside. That's how that works. And it's got these little needle bearings on the inside here to keep it concentric. So taking a look at the two output shafts here, you can see these gears here are the ones that are going to be meshing with the differential and final drive. What you probably want to know is how does it actually shift gears well you can see here most of the time these gears are going to be free spinning they're not actually meshed to the output shaft over here in order to change gears see we have a collar inside of here that's actually splined to the output shaft and this gear here has this ring you can see that that ring is going to rotate with this gear here and that collar is going to rotate with the output shaft. Now if you match speeds between this two here and you pull this collar down just like that, now you've locked the output to the input over here and this gear will be the one driving the output. All right, let's see if we can take this thing apart to have a closer look. Just gonna remove that bearing. All right, we're gonna go with the puller on that. All right, let's take this apart. And then we've got the first gear, which is the largest one here. See, it's got its needle bearings. And then this section here is the synchronizer. And the next section here is this gear. It's got its own needle bearings on the inside, so it moves freely along the shaft. Now let's take a look at how this gear changer works. Essentially, you have this collar over here, and if I remove this piece here, you can see that it's actually splined to the shaft over here, so it's always going to transmit torque. Now splined to that is this brass piece over here, and it's got a bit of a taper on the inside here, and you got one for the other gear on the other side. So here I've got my first and my second gear. So if we take a closer look at this first gear over here, you'll see that there's actually two more pieces over here. You've got another brass piece over here, which is splined to the gear itself. And then you've got this metal piece in the middle. So now you've got this side, which is splined to the gear, and this side, which is splined to this ring over here, which is selected by the forks. As I've mentioned before, once this ring completely moves over, the teeth over here and the teeth over here are going to mesh together. Now, as I've mentioned before, these gears are gonna be moving at different speeds. And when you change the gears, it's Want to grind if they're not matching speeds. So in order to match these speeds, you have these brass pieces here, which are called synchronizers. 
Now what it's going to do is, if this synchronizer is moving at the same speed as your collar, and thus the shaft, and this is moving the same speed as the input shaft is feeding it, well, this is going to slowly come together slowly as that collar is moving together and pressing it together. And because of the shape of that taper, you can see here, it's got a slight taper shape there, a slight taper shape on the inside here, as well as here. These are all going to come together and squeeze together and form one rotation. And that's going to force the input and output shafts to have the same speed through this gear only. And then finally, the notches on the collar can lock on to the notches on the gear and completely transfer 100% torque. Now this speed matching or gear synchronizing happens really fast within milliseconds because these collars move relatively fast as you change gears. Now synchronizers also exist in manual transmissions because you need to synchronize those gears together at different speeds. Now while this is technically a wear point in manual transmissions as well as these dual clutch transmissions, I doubt the dual clutch transmission synchronizers are going to go nearly as fast because you don't have that human error to mess up your gear shifts. Now taking a look at my little diagram that I drew here, here you can see we've got the outside clutch over here which powers the even gears 2, 4 and 6 and then we've got the interior clutch over here which powers the odd gears 1, 3 and 5. Now one of the main advantages to having a dual clutch transmission is that you can make really fast shifts. So let's say for example we're in first gear so that means the interior clutch here is engaged to the engine and then over here we've selected first gear so the power is going to flow through that interior shaft out to first gear and then to the output but the exterior clutch here is disengaged. That means you can pre-select second gear over here, which is going to engage it to the output, as well as the input shaft, which is going to be spinning. Because this clutch is open and not engaged with the engine, everything's just spinning in neutral. However, when the mechatronic unit thinks that it's time to change gears, all it has to do is switch these clutches to disengage the interior shaft and engage the exterior shaft, and then you've already changed the second gear. You don't have to wait for any other clutch bands or any other forks to move around. It just shifts really quickly. This means that it's going to shift much faster than an automatic or a manual transmission. However, predicting which gear you're going to be in has some downsides. Now let's say for example you stepped on the throttle and then you're in traffic and you had to release the throttle. Now you've confused that mechatronic unit and it's actually got to shift out of this gear and pre-select another gear on the other shaft and that's why you kind of get that hesitation with dual clutch transmissions. Now taking a look at the mechatronic unit, it's basically the brains of the transmission. You can see that your ECU would connect up here and control all these solenoids based on logic and that's then going to control the hydraulic circuit circuits inside the transmission to shift each gear. I'm going to go ahead and loosen up some of these Torx bolts here so you can see what's inside. Go ahead and release this bus. And this here is what one of those solenoids look like. Here's what another one of those switches look like. Alright, so with all the bolts out of there, I'm going to go ahead and open up this valve body. There we are. And as you can see inside this valve body, just like an automatic transmission, there's these little check balls and dowels, as well as a little maze for the transmission fluid to go through. Alright, I'm going to try to pry this computer off of the valve body. This computer is completely glued to the back of the valve body, so if you do need a new computer, you need to replace the entire valve body. And that's pretty much what's inside of a dual clutch automatic transmission and how it works. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.